Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a very special episode. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to do this video because you know what? Modern perfumery pisses me off. That's the reality of the situation. You know, I'm looking at some of these new releases nowadays and you look at things like, here, here are the new releases, okay? Now these are by niche houses. Creed is re-releasing Millicene 1849, which I had a 2013 bottle and I used it all up and I have a 2015 bottle right now and they're re-releasing it. Of course, it's gonna be expensive, it's a Creed, right? Why put out something new when you can just re-release stuff from the past that you put into your vault, okay? Guerlain is releasing a fragrance that used to be known as Gourmand Coquine, I believe, and now it's called Fev Gourmand. Of course, same fragrance as the idea is what people think, but it's going to be put in the new looking bottle, and of course, it's gonna be double or triple the price. Amouage is doing Jubilation 40 and Dia 40, living like a vampire off of Christopher Chong's work and re-releasing them as exceptional extras uh, and doubling or tripling the price, of course. You see the trend, okay? These are a niche. In designer, it's even worse. They're just releasing the same boring shit over and over and over. YSL's putting out stuff like Myself, uh, um, and you've got Burberry Hero, and then, of course, it's not enough to just have Burberry Hero. Then they have to do the Eau de Parfum, and Parfum, and X-Tray, and Exceptional X-Tray, and it's just complete bullshit. So, my heart uh, is with stuff like this. It is in the past, and it is with stuff like Balenciaga's Portos. Now, this is a Hall of Fame review. I'm calling it a Vintage Hall of Fame review because these are the fragrances that really inspire me. These are the fragrances that move me. These are the fragrances that make my heart skip a beat. These are the fragrances I love wearing. These are the type of fragrances right here. You can see I've gone through an entire 10 mil. This is a mini, uh, a 10 mil mini of Balenciaga Portos. And I have a full bottle. And in the mail, my good friend Al Manzano, who if you go to YouTube and just look up Balenciaga Portos, about four or five videos down, you'll see a video that was posted about nine days ago. I don't remember the chap's channel, I'm sorry, but it was Al Manzano and it was somebody else. And he was, excuse me, unboxing this um, Portos bottle that he received from a friend who claims it was sitting in the Estee Lauder's stock room for 43 years or whatever it is, 40 plus years. And um, he said it was never opened. It is a splash. The box looked impeccable. You can go see that unboxing if you'd like. It's on It's on YouTube. Um, and so he sent me a sample. Now, I think some of it leaked because there's only a little bit left, but I've been kind of using it today. Um, let's do some fresh sprays because I absolutely love, absolutely love this fragrance. So first of all, um, this is a true Hall of Fame review for me. This is one of those vintage fragrances that as an explorer of perfume from the past, this is a must sniff, okay? I'm telling you guys right now, if you like old school, masculine scents, if you like, oh, they, don't, oh, they do not make them like this anymore, my friends. And I actually have a decant of my own bottle and I'm wearing it over here on this hand and um, they are almost identical, okay? So the good news is that my bottle, you can see there's not very much air in it. So that's probably why the top notes are still so good even in mine. Uh, in Al Manzano's new bottle that was never opened, that he just opened for the first time, oh God, um, you know, it, it has just a little bit more slight prickly green in the top, like just a bit, but we're talking seconds different, not, not minutes or hours, seconds I can detect some differences in the opening, and then they just kind of converge together and they smell almost identical, which is great, which is great for, for my bottle. That means my bottle has held up fantastic for a 40-year-old fragrance, and I think it was only available for about five to seven years and then they discontinued it. Um, so it didn't run for very long. That's why there's not very many bottles of that out there. But the Castorium in this fragrance is the star of the show, okay? And it's there right from the beginning, in my opinion. Even though if you look up a note listing, you'll see the Castorium and the leather and the oak moss and all that stuff in the base. The Castorium greets you from the very start of this fragrance. It's warm. It's... Uh, buttery and it's uh, oily and aldehydic and metallic, okay? It's a metallic smelling castorium. And the thing about this fragrance is that this is a proper castorium note. This is how castorium should be done. Now, we do not know who the perfumer is. However, Al Manzano, speaking to his uh, friend, is told me that the rumor mill says that Raymond Shailan had a hand in making this perfume, okay? So I don't know whether that's true or not, but I'm just passing that along. I ended up putting this on the Raymond Shailan video, okay? 
Um, if he did make this, he deserves to be credited for it. Let's put it that way. Um, and I could see him doing a fragrance of this style. Oh, it is just... I mean, you vintage heads out there will love... I mean, now, I'll tell you this right out of the gate. This is an eau de cologne, okay? You can see... Well, does it say? Um, ah, it says it on the mini. So you can see right here, it says eau de cologne on the mini right here at the bottom. And, um, you know, this eau de cologne outshines current eau de parfum, parfum, x-rays, exceptional x-rays, all that bullshit. This kicks their ass. Absolutely just butchers them, okay? They're, they're left screaming uncle, running home to mommy. And um, to me, the 80s style of animalic fragrances is unbeatable. It's, it's, it's me in a bottle. I mean, I, this speaks to me. This is the kind of fragrance that speaks to me. And it blends with your body chemistry is really the amazing thing about this. Oh, and so um, it's just unmistakable, rough and tumble from the beginning. Now, uh, there's a little bit of mugwort in the start, so it's slightly green and spicy in the beginning. There's also some coriander that you'll get, and it mixes with oak moss and patchouli to give it a little bit of this, um, you know, almost spiky light green effect in the opening. So there's this spiky green effect, and um, I mean, to me, this is just like being raptured in into the heavens. It is just... This is the kind of stuff I love to wear. And every time, you know, my channel is a little strange because I go everywhere. So there's some folks that focus on vintage, some folks that focus on niche, some folks that focus on artisanal, some folks that focus on oud. And I like to go everywhere. Um, I'm a fan of any type of fragrance. I'll talk about it on my channel. And if I think it's shit, I'll say it's shit. And if I love it, I'll tell you what I love it. And that's from the bottom of my heart. That's not because I'm being paid by a brand or anything like that, right? So this fragrance raptures me is really the feeling. And what's crazy is the marketing advertisement for this was perfect. I mean, perfecto, okay? So if you go look up the marketing advertisement for Portos, um, first of all, it shows a man with a horse, okay? Um, and then it shows him getting into a car. Then it shows him in a tuxedo and a, and a suit, holding a newspaper, um, looking very dapper. It shows these different situations. Then it shows him on a boat, okay? Uh, and, you know, he's got the steering wheel. He's in control. And the, uh, the writing on it is virile, uh, affirmative, and convincing, okay? And virile is the word that I want to focus on today because uh, virile basically, according to Sir Webster's dictionary, okay, virile means having the nature, properties, or qualities of an adult male, okay? Not... A juvenile, not a preteen, not someone who is confused about what restroom to use, not somebody who buys into this modern day world of many, many web of lies, somebody who knows who they are inside, somebody who stands tall against the, you know, wind of, of bullshit in their face, somebody who can stand up and say, you may be able to buy everyone else, but you can't buy me because I'm my own person. And if you don't like it, fuck you. That's what this fragrance says to me. And it also means that Viral to me, specifically capable of functioning in male copulation. Okay, so this is a man who is characteristically masculine by nature. This is the definition of masculinity to me. If you're someone like me who despises modern fragrances, who despises the Ralph's Club and all the other bullshit, the blue wave that's coming, the blue aqu aquatics and, you know, the big Ambroxan bombs and all that shit. You despise where the industry is going, right? You despise the money interest coming in and owning, you know, Louis Vuitton and Guerlain and Dior and all the big important French houses and turning them into just money pits and they've lost their love of perfumery, right? You despise that. This is your out. This is the type of fragrance that allows you to give your own individuality and in how you feel. You know, to me, um, this is the, uh, you know, it's funny because if you go look at some of the pricing out there on some of these bottles, they are available. They can be had for less than those first three niche fragrances that I mentioned, the Creed, the uh, Millicent 1849, Feb Gourmand by Guerlain and Jubilation 40 and Dia 40. Those four fragrances I can almost guarantee you, you can find one, maybe two bottles of Portitos for less than one of those niche bottles. Um, and so, you know, uh, for me, I mean, it's, it's, 
it's it's a no-brainer. It's it's an absolute no-brainer. And so let me take you through a little bit of the journey of the scent because I've had this bottle for many years. This actually came from Rich Mitch. Um, and so I've worn this seven times as my scent of the day. Today makes the seventh time as I've worn this as my scent of the day, okay? And that may not seem like a lot, but when you have a collection like mine, that is a lot. I really feel like I know and understand this fragrance. Maybe not like the back of my hand, but I really know and, and, and understand it, okay? So here's how it starts, okay? Uh, it starts with this very prickly green opening. You know how there are some plants or thistles that have spikes or like points on the leaves, right? Or, you know, they'll poke you if you touch the evergreen thistle looking thing, right? There's some plants that try to defend themselves, right? From predators or goats or eating them or whatever it may be, right? Um, well, I guess predators wouldn't be eating plants, but you know what I mean. Um, and so let's say one of those plants that you would feel better putting on a gardening glove than actually just grabbing with your own hand, right? Uh, and so the opening of this is this jagged green, you know, slightly fuzzy thing. And instantly this animalic castorium, brilliant castorium. I have no clue how this castorium note was built, but it's one of the best I've ever smelled in all of perfumery. And it is virile, okay? This is a um, brilliant castorium animalic execution that, um, like I said, even though it's listed in the base, comes through from the very beginning. It comes through from the beginning and you get it almost as soon as you spray along with that green jagged edge feel, okay? brilliant castorium and executed to perfection in my personal opinion and it makes its presence known right from the start so the first few hours the castorium is out of this world now this fragrance on my skin as an eau de cologne i could smell for about eight hours okay um, for an eau de cologne that's amazing eight sometimes even eight to nine hours i can smell this fragrance on my skin but the heart of the fragrance the the if you're an animalic fan, okay? The first couple hours are where you're really going to feel that castorium. You're going to feel it pump off of your body. Um, and so what ends up happening is it, imagine that you take your hands and you stick it under your arms after being at a gym, or you take it and put it in between your legs, in between your thighs, right? And then you do like super bad, the movie, and smell them, right? That is a little bit of the feel of the castorium in this fragrance. It's slightly sweaty. It's it's um, a little bit oily, okay? So sweaty and oily kind of feel the same way, but the castorium feels oily to me. And if you know the way that I describe the civet and coro, so the civet and coros to me, it almost feels like it just is like an arrow. It goes straight to kind of a part of my brain that I have no control over, that I can't get to, that um, is when I smell things like coros or portos to me, this is primal. This is one of those parts of you as a human being that is there. You know it's there. You know of it. And sometimes you've seen it in action and activated, but you don't really know how to press that button and get to it. It just turns on and off on its own sometimes, right? That's the feeling of the, of the castorium here. It just brings to mind this fragrance at, of a man who stands up and says, I'm a man and I won't hide it. And if you're offended by it, fuck you. Get out of my way. Um, I won't apologize. I won't back down. And if my masculinity gets in the way, you're not meant to be around me. That's pretty much it. And it also tells women around you, by the way, that you are not shooting blanks. This fragrance says that you are virile, okay? You are not shooting blanks. This is a man's fragrance. This is a fragrance from a time when men were men and they knew their place in society and they knew how to be a man. And they knew how to stand up and take care of their family and all the things that a proper man should do, right? That's what this fragrance represents to me. This fragrance is a representation of an old school man from the 80s. It smells like somebody who takes care of business, who goes to work, who feeds his family, who does not just leave his kids, right? It, it feels like a man who takes responsibility for his actions, who doesn't back down from criticism, right? That's what this feels like to me in the opening. And there's something very sexualized in this. You know, castorium. So actually, if you're interested, I'll tell you this. I have done a entire this is not a top 10 video. I've done a lot of this is not a top 10 videos. Some of them are unranked. And then I went back and I ranked those this is not a top 10. For those of you who are new to my channel, uh, there's an entire playlist for this is not a top 10 ranked. There's one unranked and one ranked. 
So I've done one that is ranked focusing specifically on castorium, okay? And some of the fragrances that made that list were stuff like this. This is Robert Piguet's Bandy. This is the vintage Eau de Toilette. Literally um, one of my favorite leather fragrances of all time. Germain Cellier made this, and oh my god. I mean, this is much green. This is even greener than um, Portitos to me. But if you're a fan of leather Sheepras, proper leather Sheepras, the uh, floral heart in there with the leather and the green, you know, very butch. That's a very butch fragrance is how I would put it. Um, this is sort of the beginning of this, maybe not the beginning, but close to the beginning of this type of fragrance being developed to me. And this was actually marketed to, towards women. So God bless the women of the 1940s. And then Aramis came out. Now Aramis is a creation by uh, the great Bernard Chant, which I actually have a perfumer's portfolio video on his work. If you would like to go check that out, you can go um, watch my perfumer's portfolio video on Bernard Chant. This came out in 1964, give or take. Um, and this is actually still available, still being sold, but it's not sold like it was. It's not um, what it used to be. If you can find these older cologne versions instead of the modern eau de toilettes, I would urge you to do that just like I said Portos is an eau de cologne. This was originally sold as an eau de cologne. Um, and so this uses a little bit more spices and cumin and stuff like that. There's a clover note in here, which is not in uh, uh, Balenciaga's Portos. Um, and there's a little bit of orris and stuff like that in here that's not listed. But this is also a mossy, leathery, you know, there's things like patchouli and, and uh, vetiver and stuff like that, which you will find patchouli in um, Balenciaga's Portos. You'll find vetiver in Balenciaga's Portos. Um, the, there are some differences and we'll talk about that obviously, but Aramis actually is in the same category as Portos. They don't smell the same, okay? And this has been reformulated over the years, but if you're thinking of the same category, this and this, which share, these are five years or so apart, um, but same perfumer. This is actually, um, Aramis Azure for women, one of the greatest leather sheepers of all time that hardly anyone talks about. My God, man. Um, but these are in the same category, and I think they really influenced um, Balenciaga's Portos, okay? Because by the 80s, you have to remember that the 60s, a whole new generation had come along from the, the 1960s. The, kid, the, the men of the 60s had kids, and by the 80s, they were basically... Adult, they were they were adult men, or they look like adult men. Maybe they weren't adult men up here, but they looked like adult men by the 1980s. So this Portos was introduced, and but they wanted to make it for the 80s. Okay, they wanted to they wanted to modernize this spicy leathery accord, but still sort of um, appeal to the to the to the parents from the 60s, right? Um, and so what they've done is they've taken this castorium and castorium, uh, like I said, go watch my, this is not a top 10 castorium video. Um, but in a nutshell, what this, what this castorium is used for by the beavers is it's, um, part of the, their castor sack and adult, okay. Adult male beavers mark their territory using the castorium. It's mixed with the piss and they basically mark their territories doing that. Um, and it is a, uh, note that is used in many different industries worldwide. It's a very coveted ingredient. Um, and many of the castorium notes that you're smelling nowadays are synthetic. I don't know for sure, but it feels like this has real castorium. It feels like that to me. Maybe even back then it was synthetic, but it doesn't feel synthetic to me compared to the castorium stuff I've smelled nowadays. This smells so natural. So beautiful and natural to me, even though it is virile and sexualized and it's got this sexual tension feel to it, you know, just like you're staring at a woman for maybe a little bit too long and she kind of catches it, but she doesn't look away because she's also kind of staring at you. There's a little bit of that in there. Okay. Um, something very sexualized, very oily in this blend. Just think of an oil spill on the ocean, right? And obviously oil and water don't mix, but Think of the oil spill just sitting on the ocean. Think of the Exxon Valdez, you know, um, spill from the 80s. And think about being in a helicopter and looking over sea and you can see all this water, right? And the oil spill is very prominent right there. Um, but and just think of this very oily, slick feeling 
uh, of the spill in the ocean, sitting in the ocean. And in my mind, that's kind of how I imagine the castorium in this fragrance. It's very oily and very slick. And I wouldn't be surprised, even though there's no aldehydes listed, in the top there's coriander, bergamot, and mugwort. But I get those green notes, but I also get a lot of the castorium right there from the beginning. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if, just like Bernard Chant, who's one of the masters of aldehydes, I mean, I don't think anybody revolutionized a note to me where he did it in a way that no one else had done it like before with aldehydes, with his Aramis, Aramis 900, all these different perfumes he put out, right? Um, Azure and all that good stuff. And then no one was able to use aldehydes like he was. It was like he was one of one as a perfumer. And it feels like Balenciaga's Portos tries to take some of that. It tries to take some of that aldehydic castorium is what it feels like. It feels like um, sort of the traces of aldehydes mixing with the castorium. Give it a little bit of air. You know, yesterday when I was reviewing a Sultan Pasha Attar, which Attars are not my thing, okay? But yesterday I was reviewing the Sultan Pasha Attar, and I said that the Attars feel very dense and thick. And, and you know, one thing my brother Rich Mitch from across the pond said is many of these French-style perfumes, they feel like you can stand up and walk around inside of them and there's space, right? The Attars seem very densely packed, right? Uh, just pure oil, pure energy. And in here, the aldehyde just seem to blow the leather and castorium note up, right? They just make it seem, they make it seem um, slightly airy in a way, which seems very strange, but it's the best way I can describe it. You know, think about a, a balloon being blown up, right? The, the rubber in the balloon is actually only, you know, this big. But when you blow it up, the balloon ends up being this big and you've got all of this circumference, right? That's the way that the leather and the castorium note feel in this fragrance to me. And they feel very slick and very oily and um, very hard to describe, to be quite honest with you. But what happens as the fragrance begins to dry down, so as that hour turns into the two hour mark, it loses some of that prickly green sort of touch that I was mentioning in the opening that earthy green mugwort, which you've smelled this sort of accord in other masculine fragrances from the 80s. If you've smelled other 80s fragrances, you know this type of accord. And this very green, earthy, prickly uh, accord takes a back seat and it, and it loses some of that, um, you know, think of a earthquake, right? Think of uh, whenever an earthquake hits and you see that machine that monitors the, the trembles on in the earth, right? The castorium in this has this energetic, like, you know, um, almost like this frenetic energy that just gets released in the first couple hours, which sounds much dirtier than what I meant it to be. But there is this sort of just true frenetic energy just being just released. And, um, you know, it um, it's, it's, it's very interesting because it loses that as the hours tick by so that that prickly green I was mentioning, take a back seat, the earthy greenness. Um, and what tends to come to the forefront is this smoother leather. So it's like release and then everything is calmer and smoother and gentler. And um, the leather note, if you will, seems moisturized. It feels like you took some leather cleaner and leather moisturizer and put it on there. And it becomes very smooth and resinous. Okay, because what comes to the forefront along with that very smooth leather note to my nose is myrrh and and a little bit of frankincense, but not like in not like a vintage amouage where an oriental style frankincense, but just a little bit of frankincense to add a little bit of smoke to this leather accord, if you will, uh, and labdanum. Okay, and, and the labdanum adds a little bit of this um, sticky resinous feel, but it's not like a heavy... It's not like Tom Ford, Sahara Noir, or anything like that. It's not like a heavy labdanum. It's just there as part of the overall ambery, mossy, musky base, if you will. In this fragrance, I should mention, it does feel slightly musky as well. So it feels like a little bit of a vintage musky dry down, if you will. But that castorium, even though it has settled, right? That frenetic energy explosion I was mentioning earlier settles. It's still there. You never lose it for the entire length of the fragrance. As long as I can smell the fragrance... It has a little bit of that animalic vibe. It has a little bit of that animalic feel. It has a little bit of that um, dirtiness there. A little bit of that wink, you know? A little bit of that. Uh, just a bit. 
into the dry down. It begins to become calmer. So I have a dry down here. And so right now I can smell the leather accord much, much smoother. Okay. The leather and the myrrh sort of join forces to create this slightly resinous leather with a little bit of that smoke peeking through and this old school 80s muskiness. And if you smelled some of the musky fragrances of the 80s, you know exactly what I mean. This, um, this musk, this 80s style musk, if that makes sense. And, um, you know, it feels just more, the leather note becomes more prominent and, and smooth, extremely smooth, uh, ex extremely, you know, this is the stage of the fragrance where I would feel most comfortable wearing this to work. Okay. Now, a couple things I should mention. So if you know the house of Etienne Eigner, speaking of wearing this style of perfume to work, if you know the house of Etienne Eigner, uh, they're a house that actually was has already made one of my vintage um, Hall of Fame videos for their fragrance called Super Fragrance from the late 70s, 78. And um, they actually made a fragrance that came out one year after Davidoff's Zeno, okay? And it was called Free Life. And the reason I bring that up is they put out a fragrance a couple years after Balenciaga's Portitos that to me um, feels like a little bit more of like a classier easier to wear to work version of Portos. Portos is sort of that sexualized tension, right? It's sort of the, like I said earlier, I'm a man, I'm not going to apologize for it. And, you know, we're just, um, you know, that's just who we are by nature. This is a little bit more, yes, I'm still a man. This is called Eigner Silver. And uh, this is my favorite Eigner fragrance of all time. And this basically is a more buttoned up version of Portitos, to my nose, if you will. So Eigner's Silver, like I said, came out a couple years later. And what they've done is they toned down the castorium in the top, okay? So it's not just right there in your face. This came out in 84. This is four years after Portitos, okay? And they've added this fennel-like smell in the top. And a note that I think is very underutilized in perfumery, spruce. And spruce is a note that I wish they used more of. I love spruce, but it literally has those prickly needle effect I was talking about earlier. Um, and they've added a carnation note, which I really, really like in here. So they've added a brilliant spicy green carnation note. But listen to the base notes of Eigner Silver. Castorium, frankincense, moss, labdanum, leather, and musk. Almost identical base notes to Portos. And so as it dries, it becomes closer to the dry down of Portos. But... The green touches in the spruce and the, and the very, um, the, the energetic bit here is from the juniper and some of the other notes that the lemony, juniper, stuff like that, that just make it a little bit um, more palatable for work, okay? Like if I was going to pick one of these to wear to work, I would definitely wear Eigner Silver to work. And I, and I sent, I've got a couple of these 10 mil minis that I scored and you can see the 90 proof so you know it's a vintage, um, Etienne Eigner Cosmetics in Munich. Um, and, and so you know that uh, this is old. These, this is long, long discontinued, just like Portitos. And I sent one of these to Al Manzano for his very kind gift from his brand new bottle of Portitos. And um, this really inspired me to do this video today, right? Really inspired me to do this because I've been waiting to do this Hall of Fame review for a long time. And today I said, you know what? I'm just going to do it. I'm, I'm just going to knock it out. I'm going to give my thoughts. I'm going to put it out there because this fragrance deserves more love, uh, especially for the vintage heads. Portitos is, um, it, it's a hall of fame vintage fragrance for me. One of, one of my all time favorites. I don't remember where I put it on my top 100, but I know it was, you know, it was high. Uh, I think it's, uh, as I was wearing it today, um, you know, I would have a very hard time putting anything over this number one. So even Balenciaga Porom may sit one step behind Portitos on my personal ranking. I know Balenciaga Porom is a Hall of Fame. I did a vintage review on Balenciaga Porom, actually a vintage Hall of Fame review on that. So this is the second Balenciaga vintage Hall of Fame fragrance that made the list, if you will. And so, you know, but it's a different era. Balenciaga Porom was 10 years after that, after this. And you can see how much times have changed in a decade. Uh, but this is a harbinger of things to come in the 1980s. You have to remember, this is before um, Antaeus. This is before Koros. Um, this is 
before many of the big time 80s Furio and stuff like that. This is before all of that, before Tenere, all that stuff. Um, and, and so for me, Portitos is um, this, I will cherish this bottle forever, honestly. Every single drop of this juice is very precious to me and I'm very, very grateful to, to have it. Um, <laughs> it, is, uh, it is unbelievable, really an unbelievable fragrance. And you know, it speaks to me. This is a fragrance that really speaks to me. And uh, everything that I mentioned about standing against some of the bullshit that society throws at us, I really feel like um, Portitos is one of those fragrances that uh, shows your individuality. It shows who you are as a man. This fragrance shows who you are as a man. And while everyone else around you is wearing blue to Chanel this and all this other crap, you'll be wearing something like this that says, I don't, I don't play your game. I, I, I march to my own drum and probably um, the men will be like, what the hell are you wearing? And the women will be like, oh, what are you wearing? Uh, because they don't smell. This is not something that they're going to smell on every street corner. This is not what the this is not what the men in their thirties are going to be wearing. Okay, and I love that about this. I absolutely adore these vintage fragrances, uh, and I think stuff like this deserves more hype and talk in the community, especially with the crap, the absolute dribble. I mean, these houses are just drooling on themselves at this point now, um, and you know they're uh, for for what they're doing. Um, People are turning over their hard-earned money to these houses, or they're just not buying as much. I know I know. Um, there's been a decline in sales. There's a lot of sales rep who say people are walking up to the counter smelling stuff. They go, oh, I kind of like that. What's the price? They hear the price and they leave. They're not buying it. Uh, the prices have gotten so ridiculous in the perfume market, they're just not going to participate. And if you're somebody like me who likes going against the grain, if you like going against the stream, all the fish are going that way, you want to go this way, stop playing the game, take a step back, Stop giving them your money. Don't buy any of those exceptional X rates or any of that bullshit and go buy a vintage bottle of this. Um, you know, the biggest risk you have with buying vintage fragrances is that you don't know what you're going to get. You know, it's a little bit of a crapshoot, right? Because this is a 40 year old fragrance. It's 40 years old. It's older than me. Um, and so that's the biggest thing. You have to buy from a trusted seller and all that good stuff. But um, you will find much more satisfaction, let's say. In stuff like this than the new just recycling rehashing they're out of ideas just like movies they're same shit over and over they're out of ideas right they're gonna make fast and the furious 87 pretty soon right they're out of ideas so go back to when they actually had ideas go back to when you know people with ideas weren't kicked out of the boardroom because they're up overturning the apple cart right go back to a time when people could still think for themselves sort of uh, um, so Portitos by Balenciaga, vintage Hall of Fame review, probably with all the good things I said, I still probably didn't say enough. It is fantastic. Um, fantastic. Uh, there's no honey note listed in this, by the way, but there is a little bit of a slight, sometimes you get a little hint of a honeyed, uh, like an aldehydic honey feel. What a fragrance, man. Um, Balenciaga's Portitos, vintage Hall of Fame review. Let me know if you have experience with this absolute gem. Thank you. Mr. Al Manzano for your decant. I hope you enjoy getting to know Eigner Silver. I'd love to hear your thoughts, my friend. Cheers, guys, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.